So, in the last lecture we saw properties of L2 of mu in particular we characterized uh, continuous linear functionals. So, when I say functional it is a map from the vector space to the underlying field. So, in the case of L2 of mu the underlying field is the complex plane and the linear functional is a linear map from L2 of mu to the complex plane and we saw that any continuous linear functional is a is given by an inner product. So, we will use that in the proof of uh, radon nicodin theorem. So, that is what uh, we will do today. Uh, in this uh, proof of uh, radon nicodin theorem, in fact, we we prove two theorems together. So, the one is called the Lebesgue decomposition of a measure of a complex measure with respect to a sigma finite positive measure, and there is the radon nicodin theorem. So, both the proofs are combined into one proof and this is a beautiful proof due to uh, von Neumann and uh, uh, which is what we should be able to do in the next two sessions. Okay. So, let us start. So, aim, aim is to prove, prove what is known as Lebesgue Radon Nicodin theorem. Nicodin theorem. So, these are two theorems. So, one is the Lebesgue decomposition theorem and the Radon Nicodin theorem. So, I will I will explain that. So, let us so, we will we'll use L R N just to uh, use the short form for Lebesgue Radon Nicodin theorem. So, uh, make sure that you understand these are two theorems one is the Lebesgue decomposition and other is the Radon Nicodin theorem. Okay, so, theorem. <coughs> so, statement has two parts because there are two theorems. Uh, so, as usual we have um, a space and a sigma algebra. Okay. Let mu be a positive sigma finite measure okay, on f or x. Okay, and let lambda be a complex measure, complex measure on x. So, first theorem says, first part of the theorem says that you can decompose lambda into two parts, one is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, other is singular with respect to mu. Okay. So, that is the first part. So, this is called the Lebesgue decomposition. There exists a unique pair. So, unique pair of complex num complex measures, complex measures. So, it is unique complex measures lambda sub a. So, A stands for absolute continuity and lambda sub s. So, that is the singular part of lambda on same sigma algebra first such that such that the original measure lambda is a sum of these two lambda A plus lambda s. Well, this is not very it is it is important, but it you know it's writing a complex measure as sum of two other complex measures is not what is the big deal. Big deal is that the components are so the lambda a is the absolute continuous part of lambda with respect to mu. So remember mu is the positive sigma finite measure on f, and the lambda s which is the singular part. So that is mutually singular with respect to mu. So, this is called the Lebesgue decomposition theorem. So, Lebesgue decomposition theorem. Okay. So, recall uh, absolutely continuous means. So, lambda a is absolutely continuous with respect to mu means mu of a equal to 0 implies lambda a of E equal to 0 right? and they are mutually singular means they are concentrated on they are concentrated on disjoint set. 
concentrated on disjoint sets. Right. So, we had defined all these and looked at various uh, elementary properties of uh, mutually ab absolutely continuous and mutually singular measures and so on. So, the first part of the theorem is the Lebesgue decomposition, second is the redon nicotin theorem. So, what is that? There exists a unique unique H in L 1 mu. So, mu remember is the fixed positive sigma finite, sigma finiteness is important sigma finite measure such that such that lambda a of e. So, lambda a is the absolute continuous part of lambda with respect to mu is given by h h d mu. So, this is true of course, for every e script f right. So, this is the radon nicotin theorem. So, radon nicotin theorem ok. So, if I have a complex measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to a positive sigma finite measure, then the complex number measure is given by an integral with respect to the uh, positive sigma finite measure and there is an h right. So, there is a unique h in L 1 mu which does this. The h is called the radon nicotin derivative. So, h is called which is called the radon nicotin derivative derivative of lambda a with respect to mu ok. So, sometimes we also denote this by the derivative of lambda a with respect to mu in the usual uh, d y by d x notation right. So, you are differentiating y with respect to x you use this notation, but this is just a symbol. So, remember that this is just a symbol, symbol for h ok. So, this is h. So, h is called the radon nicotin derivative. So, two parts to the theorem the first part is so one could have stated this as two theorems you can take any complex measure lambda and you can decompose it in this form right where one of them is absolutely continuous with respect to mu another is a mutually singular with respect to mu. And as a second theorem which is the radon nicotin theorem if I have a measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to mu that is the case with lambda a here. So, lambda s may not exist. So, for example, lambda could be absolutely continuous with respect to mu then you will have a radon nicotin derivative ok. So, h. So, keep in mind the assumptions lambda is a complex measure ok. So, so mod lambda which is the total variation would be a finite measure right. So, if a lambda is positive then it has to be a finite measure otherwise it is not a subset of the collection of complex measures ok. So, the, the theorem can be proved for two sigma finite two, two positive measures uh, lambda and mu I will I will write it down um, after this is proved ok. So, I hope this uh, the statement is uh, clear. So, for the proof we need several things. So, for the proof for the proof we need uh, well at least two auxiliary results. So, let us let us write this as two results well actually three, but uh, one of them was proved in the last uh, two lectures where continuous linear functionals on L 2 mu was given by inner products. So, the first result we need is if mu is a positive sigma finite measure on x f. So, mu is what uh, the positive sigma finite measure is in the theorem as well. Then there exists uh, an omega in L 1 mu ok such that 0 less than 
w let us say w x less than 1 for every x in x. So, it is a function which is between 0 and 1 and it is in L 1 ok it is strictly. So, note the strict inequalities ok especially that it is strictly greater than 0 is something which we will we will be uh, using ok. So, let us note that well it is it is very easy to construct this ok. So, there is nothing very surprising about this, but we will we will use this particular w to convert mu into a, pos a positive finite measure. So, so, remember this is a positive function which is in L 1 and so when I use w to define a measure it is going to have finite uh, the total measure would be finite ok. So, let us prove this first. So, this is sort of easy. So, mu is sigma finite mu is sigma finite which means the whole space I can write as union of x n n equal to 1 to infinity disjoint disjoint if they are not disjoint you can disjointify them such that mu of x n is well I can say it is strictly positive and less than fine infinity right. So, you can write it as a countable union of sets with finite positive finite measure right that is what sigma finiteness means ok. So, now you simply so, so this is this is your x and your you are having x n s right. So, let us say these are these are x n. So, I have x 1, I have x 2, I have x 3 and x 4 ok and well there, there can be countably many right countably infinitely many. So, all you have to do is to get a w in L 1 is to define w to be constant in each of these components. So, that some integral is finite right and make sure that this is true right that is all we need to do ok. So, simply define define w of x to be equal to 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 2 to the n because you wanted to add up times. So, I am going to define so n denotes the n of the x n ok. So, on x n I am going to define some constant ok. So, this is 1 plus mu of x n this is for x in capital X n. So, capital X n appears here as well. So, mu of x n is a positive finite quantity right. So, all this makes sense 1 by 1 plus mu of x n is a finite number positive number. I multiply it with 1 by 2 to the n for x in x n. So, that is my quantity right. So, so w is defined to be so here it is uh, 1 by 2 into 1 by 1 plus mu of x 1 ok. Here it is 1 by 2 square into 1 by 1 plus mu x 2 etcetera etcetera right. So, in each of these sets x 1, x 2, x 3 it is a constant, it is a number, it is a positive number right. So, obviously, w is strictly positive. So, w of x is strictly positive and of course, it is less than strictly less than 1 right. So, this is true for every x in x. It is clearly measurable because this in each x i's are measurable and you are multiplying the indicator function of x i with some constant right. So, so you can write so let us write w a bit more. So, what is w? So, this is the summation n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 1 plus mu of x n times indicator of x n right the characteristic function of x n at x. So, if I take an x it would be in one of the x n's right all the other ones will be 0 and I will get 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 1 plus mu x n as the value. So, this is obviously measurable ok all right, but there are other um, assertions that w is actually in L 1 of omega. So, let us let us justify that but it is it is very simple right it is a it is a linear combination of indicator function. So, you can simply integrate. So, let us see why is w is in L 1. So, w is in L 1 of mu ok why is that uh, you look at integral over x w d mu I want to compute this right. So, this is equal to w is given by an infinite sum right. So, integral over x summation n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 1 plus 
mu of x n. So, you will see why 1 by 1 plus mu of x n was used chi x n right x d mu x. So, this is my w right. So, this is w of x. Okay, everything is positive. So, uh, you can apply monotone convergence theorem to interchange the summation and integral or since everything is positive you can apply Fubini's theorem because I have summation, summation is an integral. So, I have two integrals and I want to interchange right. So, this is equal to summation n equal to 1 to infinity uh, integral of 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 1 plus mu of x n. So, these are constants times the function right indicator of x n at x d mu x ok by. So, you can apply by monotone convergence theorem or Fubini's theorem ok because we have positive functions we have two integrals. So, you can interchange the integrals which is equal to. So, this is a constant. So, that comes out n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by 2 to the n 1 by 1 plus mu of x n mu of x n is some number right positive number. Then I am integrating the characteristic function of x n. So, I will get the measure of x n there is nothing else. So, then now you see why I have put a 1 by 1 plus mu x n instead of simply mu x n ok. Well, you can take mu x n also. So, this this quantity is less than or equal to 1 and so this would be less than or equal to summation n equal to 1 to infinity 1 by 2 to the n which is finite right. And so, w being a positive function has integral finite. So, it is integrable ok. So, hence w belongs to L 1 of mu ok. But what is important for us is that. So, here is an exercise. So, w is strictly positive and strictly less than 1. So, strictly less than 1 will be used perhaps at some point, but strictly positive is important. This implies that if integral over e w d mu ok is 0, then mu of e will have to be 0 ok. So, I will I'll leave this as an exercise should think about it, it is not difficult to see. If, if integral over e w d mu is 0 see because w is strictly positive correct. So, if mu of if e is not 0, then there would be some n for which w is greater than 1 by n and you will get the integral to be strictly greater than 0. But if the integral is 0 of a strictly positive function, then the set of the measure has to be 0 ok. So, that is that is an easy exercise. We, so, this is what is more important to us ok. So, in fact, in fact integral over w sorry integral over e w d mu equal to 0 if and only if mu is 0 ok. So, this the the point is whenever the left hand side is 0 right hand side is 0 whenever the right hand side is 0 I am integrating over a set of measures 0. So, I will get 0. So, that is the easy part and w d mu I can think of as another measure. So, this measure on the left hand side and this measure on the right hand side has same set of uh, measure 0 sets ok. So, the collection of measure 0 sets are same mu of e is 0 if and only if the left hand side is 0 that is the important part we will use ok. okay. So, the next uh, so, this is one of the results we need second result is about averages of the function. So, let us let us take um, positive measures. So, positive mu is positive and finite ok finiteness well one can relax the uh, restriction finiteness, but let us let us not worry too much about it right now. So, it is a finite measure ok. Suppose g is a complex valued complex valued measurable function on x such that the averages of g 
so i'll tell you what the averages are averages of g are in a closed set closed set uh, let's say s inside the complex plane so what are averages of g that is that is for every e in script f with with mu of e positive okay it, it will be finite because mu of x is finite for for the capital x the total space has finite measure so mu of e will also be fine the average so what is the average well you integrate the function over e right and then divide by the total mass of e or the measure of e so this is what we mean by an average right this is a complex number and that should be in s okay so i mean why do we say average so let us look at uh, the real line if i take uh, an interval like ab and i integrate a to b f t d t right so this is the integral of f but when i say average i will be dividing by the length of the interval right so that and these are the averages you know so the this is the abstraction of uh, the concrete things you have seen before okay so averages of g are inside s okay then conclusion is then g of x belongs to s almost everywhere okay so let us let's try to write this in some pictorial form so this is my s okay so i'm i'm in the complex plane right so i have some closed set s and all the averages are inside then g itself takes values inside remember g is a function from x to the complex plane right and the set s is a subset of the complex plane okay so if all the averages fall inside s then g itself takes values inside s almost everywhere of course g may take one value here which can be on a set of measure 0 etc etc okay so let us try to prove this so maybe i i draw a picture again so let's say this is my s this is the this is a closed set okay closed set so let's take some w outside so w is not in s so so i can put a ball around w which does not intersect s right so let's call that r so i look at ball around w of radius r that is in s complement okay and look at g inverse of b w r okay so let's call this set e what do i want to show i need to show that need to show that e has measure 0 well of course this is measurable because g is measurable so when i look at the inverse image of an open set in the complex plane i'll get a set in script f we need to show that mu e is zero why because if i show this s complement can be written as can be written as countable union of this right like this like this like b w r so for each of them i know its inverse image has measure 0 so it will follow that if i look at g inverse of s complement okay and take the measure mu so that would be sum of mu of g inverse of or less than or equal to if you like of certain balls which have measure 0 so we if we prove this this part then these things will have measure zero so this would be zero what does this mean so this is so if i write it in uh, expanded so this is all those points x in x such that x is in g inverse of s complement that is same as g of x is in s complement this has measure zero so if x is this all those points which 
go outside s that has measure 0. So, the points here will go inside s and this has measure 0 which means that g takes values inside s almost everywhere. Okay. So, this is just uh, two lines proof it is very easy. So, let us try to prove that. So, we, we start with uh, we start with a w outside and look at g inverse of uh, b w r right. Okay. Now, suppose so I want to show that mu of e is 0. Okay. So, suppose mu of e is positive okay. it is finite right. So, consider the average consider the average integral uh, 1 by mu e integral over e g d mu. Of course, I know that this has to belong to s right because all the averages belong to s. But let us look at the distance of this from w. So, if I look at 1 by mu e integral over e g d mu minus w well this I can write as 1 by mu e integral over e g x minus w d mu x. Okay. That is because w is a constant that will come out and d mu e will give me mu e and mu e will get cancelled right that is why it is called the average. So, so take modulus hence so we are last line in the proof. So, modulus of 1 by mu e integral over e g d mu. So, this is some complex number minus w this is less than or equal to 1 by mu e integral over e modulus of g x minus w d mu x mu is a positive measure. So, this makes sense right. Now, on e what happens to so, what is e? e is the inverse image of b w r right the ball which is outside outside s. So, g of x would be here right. So, if x is in e g of x would be inside this ball right this is my set e okay which means g of x and w are at a distance at most r so this is less than or equal to r so that r is a constant i can take it outside i'll have mu e mu e cancelling each other i have r so i have another i have a complex number here whose distance from w is less than or equal to r so then that complex number will be in this ball right because that is the ball of radius r centered at w, but that is not possible because the average should be in s right. So, this will be in a ball of radius r centered at r is a contradiction contradiction because, because the average is supposed to be inside average is supposed to be inside s and and this and b w r is inside s complement. So, that is not possible. Okay. So, that is a contradiction and the contradiction comes because I can make this average by assuming mu e is positive. Okay. So, hence mu e is 0 hence mu of e equal to 0. Okay. So, that proves the second assertion. Okay. So, second assertion was that if I have averages inside a close set in the in the complex plane then g itself will take values in that close set. So, we will see this if averages of g is let us say between 0 and 1 then g has to take values between 0 and 1 and things like that we will use. Okay. And third one is of course, continuous linear functionals on uh, L 2 of mu. So, these three results we will use. Okay. So, third one continuous linear functionals on functionals on L 2 of mu are given by inner products. So, we have already proved this given by inner products. Yeah. Okay. So, we will stop here. Uh, so, we just proved some auxiliary results which will be used in the proof of uh, the radonic coordinate theorem and the Lebesgue decomposition. So, the three results which we need are one is uh, if you have a sigma finite positive measure you can get a function w in L 1 which is strictly positive and 
the measure defined by that w will have the same sets uh, which are uh, the same 0 sets as the sigma finite positive sigma finite measure mu that is the first thing. So, that is essentially shifting or changing the or transferring the positive sigma finite measure to a finite measure without changing the sets of measure 0 ok that is the a uh, that is the usefulness of the first result. Second one says that the averages of a function belongs to some closed set then the function should itself be in that uh, closed set almost everywhere ok. Third one is the continuous linear functional on L2 of mu are given by inner products. So, these three will be used uh, in the proof in the next lecture ok. So, we will stop here.